Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming out. I am Maria Safiotti Dale, and I'm president at the Friends of UW Madison Libraries. And as such, I would like to welcome you to the 2023 annual Chave Lecture by Dr. Tara A. Bynum Ober Tanner's Archive, or How to Remember Your Famous Friend, Phyllis Wheatley. Dr. Bynum's lecture is being presented in conjunction with the exhibition currently on view in the Department of Special Collections and Memorial Library, entitled On Various Subjects, 250 Years of Phyllis Wheatley, curated by Jonathan Senshin, Associate Professor of Book History and Print Culture, and Bridget Fielder, Associate Professor in the College of Letters and Science. We are proud to partner with the Center for the History of Print and Digital Culture at the Information School to bring you tonight's presentation. Also, many thanks go to the University Lectures Committee for the award provided by the Anonymous Fund for additional support. For 75 years, the Friends of the Libraries has been championing our great library system here at UW-Madison. We are an all-volunteer organization that strives to bring visibility to campus libraries and to the world-class collections they hold. And we encourage students to consider careers in academic libraries and archives. Our activities are made possible by donations in two different forms, monetary gifts and used books. You can give to the friends anytime, or in particular, on Giving Tuesday, which is coming up on November 28th. If you prefer in-kind giving, you can donate your books to the Friends and we will include them in our semi-annual book sales. Funds raised provide grant support to UW-Madison libraries and to scholars who come from around the world to research in the exceptional library collections. Friends funding also supports a wide variety of free public events and lectures such as this one tonight. We invite you to join us in supporting the UW libraries. Please follow us on social media and check out our website for more information as well as our YouTube channel for recordings of past events. You may be wondering what the name Chave refers to in the title of today's annual lecture. In 2006, the Friends received an endowment bequest from a beloved member of the Madison arts community, Douglas Chave, which, became, which came with a very specific charge, quote, to encourage the campus and the larger community to read print books and to host speakers with sound, balanced academic scholarship encouraging the diversity of study or those speakers of contemporary literary merit in furtherance of the sifting and winnowing principle of the Uni University of Wisconsin. We hope to do just that in honor of Doug Chavez's memory and generosity with this evening's lecture by Dr. Bynum. And now to introduce tonight's speaker, I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming to the podium Professor Bridget Fielder. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, it's truly an honor to be able to introduce such a wonderful colleague as Dr. Tara Bynum. Um, uh, and and I, I really, really mean that sincerely. She's been uh, a, a, an excellent uh, collaborator and interlocutor. Um, I've learned so much from her just in the past hour of chit chat, um, walking around the Wheatley exhibit. Um, it's always a joy to get hear her talk about anything. Dr. Tara Bynum is an assistant professor at English and African American Studies at the University of Iowa, specializing in African American literary histories before 1800. Dr. Bynum is a renowned scholar, working at the forefront of early African American studies and also driving some of its key conversations. She's held research fellowships from some of the nation's most prestigious institutions supporting research in early American studies, including the John Carter Brown Library, the American Antiquarian Society, the Library Company of Philadelphia, 
the McNeil Center for Early American Studies, the Omohundro Institute for Early American History and Culture, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Dr. Bynum has published her work in a plethora of journals, including Early American Literature, J19, the Journal of 19th Century Americanists, Legacy, a Journal of American Women Writers, American Periodicals, and Criticism, and in edited collections such as The Global History of Black Girlhood and African American Literature in Transition for the volume from 1750 to 1800. Dr. Bynum's first book, Reading Pleasures, Everyday Black Living in Early America, was published by the University of Illinois Press in 2023. The book treats the complexity and fullness of black life in the early United States by looking beyond experiences of suffering or protest to also find joy. Reading Pleasures is truly what one might call an instant classic, an absolute must read for scholars of early American studies, which will be read and cited and engaged for decades to come. But moreover, I recommend it to a general audience of readers interested in early US literature or history, and particularly who those who feel they may not have learned enough about black life during this period. And I wanna give you just a little sampling of what um, uh, Dr. Bynum is able to do here. She writes, Wheatley's letters are neither too lengthy nor too short, but just long enough to evidence what matters most to her. And of course, what matters most depends upon to whom she is writing. For example, when Wheatley writes to Selina Hastings, the Countess of Huntingdon, she seems most concerned about whether or not her travel plans will hinder her availability to meet the Countess. When she writes to John Thornton, Wheatley notes Susanna Wheatley's death and is thankful for his book recommendations and for her own return to better health. Her letters take us into her everyday life with its travels, its Christian worship, and its commitments to friends and acquaintances. In her letters, she is no longer a solitary young woman on a frontispiece or an enslaved teenager who is compelled to write poems to amuse and delight the Wheatley family. Every letter takes us out of the confines of the engraved room of the poetry's collections frontispiece into geographies of community, worship, friendship, and 18th century urban and revolutionary era living. Reading her letters, it's easy to see that Wheatley isn't just a lonely poet, but rather she admits to her various interiorities while in conversation with her interlocutors. She confesses to her likes, her desires, and her Christian worship. Wheatley's letters have her admit to an interiority that is, at best, difficult to access because it is inward and personal. It's not only dissent and revision, but also the sight of those pleasures that make life's changes private, palatable, and possible. In an alumni profile from Johns Hopkins University where Dr. Bynum earned her PhD, she talks about teaching and researching and storytelling. And in her careful, uh, as you can see and will soon experience, Dr. Bynum is truly an expert in her craft of storytelling. In her careful and nuanced recounting of African American literary histories, Moreover, she has extends the storytelling about early African American literary history beyond academic writing and classroom teaching to other venues like radio, podcasts, television, digital spaces, and public events like this one. And because she has so deftly honed her craft of storytelling, she presents meticulously researched information and complex arguments with an astounding clarity that few academic researchers possess. The story about that, that Dr. Bynum tells us about Wheatley and about other early African Americans more generally is one too often hidden in the background when people prioritize black people's relationships to white people rather than to each other. In Dr. Bynum's discussions of Wheatley's friendship and correspondence with Ober Tanner presents a view of the author beyond discussions of her as an exceptional figure and places her within the context of a black community rather than in relation to her enslavers and their white acquaintances or to other prominent historical figures who allowed their racism and sexism to prevent them from beginning to understand black women intellectuals like her. And while Wheatley has alternately been degraded and celebrated across history, she's often tokenized, divorced from this larger black context. Bynum's 
methodologies for reading Wheatley, not merely as an individual, but via these networks and relations, represents an intervention not only for the study of Wheatley, but for larger necessary conversations about how we tell stories about black history. And I've had the privilege of collaborating with Bynum um, on recent editorial work in Wheatley Studies, and I've been learning about her and uh, on Wheatley and other early African American contexts for going on 15 years now. I'm always truly left grateful for her work in this field and joyful to continue to learn more from her. Hi. Okay. Have to do some maneuvering. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited to be here and to chat with you all this evening. Um, thank you so much for coming out, for joining me in uh, what I hope will be a, a lively sort of engagement with Wheatley and Uber Tanner and uh, their relationship. Thank you, of course, to Bridget for that lovely and fantastic introduction to Jonathan, uh, for the invitation, and for the uh, friends of the University of Wisconsin Libraries, too, for their help um, in organizing this event. Um, thank you, too, to the many folks who whose names I don't know who helped to make this evening happen as well. I appreciate all of it. And let me just reiterate what uh, Maria mentioned before. You all should go see the Wheatley exhibit. It's in the library. It's on the ninth floor. Check it out. Um, so let me say first that it, uh, the the talk that I have prepared this evening is, I almost imagine, like, a chapter that didn't make it into the book. Um, it is born out of the research that I did for this book. Um, this book is, I think as uh, Bridget kind of very astutely kind of summarizes, is about kind of thinking through black people in much more complex ways than often happens. I'm interested in how they, how they feel good, how they relate to one another. And I am, I guess, less less interested in, I think, what so often gets talked about, like the their political status, the kind of imposition of various forms of oppression, which is not to deny those, but to instead say that when dealing with human beings, no one is ever one-dimensional, but in fact, multi-dimensional with, with a host of interests, a host of feelings, and all of that kind of matters, and in particular matters in the relationship that exists between these two women, Phyllis Wheatley and Uber Tanner. So with that said, y'all get ready. We're traveling back in time. We're now in the 18th century. And I've used this letter here uh, just as a, as a way to kind of get us back in time. It's a, a July uh, 1772 letter from Phyllis Wheatley to Uber Tanner. I'll let you all know that I don't actually explicitly reference this letter, but instead talk about all of the letters writ large, which look a lot like this letter, which is why I put it in front of you. So if you cannot read the letter, either because the resolution is off or because the cursive doesn't kind of work with you, don't worry, because it actually isn't going to get explicitly referenced. It just is a time portal. So with that said, let us go back. When Phyllis Wheatley dies in 1784 on a Sunday in December, her death is national news. It's first noted a week later in several New England area newspapers, the Massachusetts Sentinel, the Connecticut Current, and the Independent Chronicle and Universal Advertiser. And it reads, last Lord's Day died Phyllis Peters, formerly Phyllis Wheatley, known to the literary world by her celebrated miscellaneous poems. Mortuary notices listed on the second or third page and tucked between mentions of shipments in local trivia carry the news to far-flung locales such as Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Charleston, South Carolina. There are at least 13 of these notices and each is brief and redundant and a kind of collective mourning ritual. 
Every announcement by way of its brevity and repetition is an iterative and public invitation to remember who she was. Each proves her real. And because she's real enough to be mourned in print, there's just enough space made in the column for each to say what's been said before. Last Lord's Day died, Phyllis Peters, formerly Phyllis Wheatley, known to the literary world by her celebrated miscellaneous poems. Sometimes the last word of the notice, poems, is capitalized for the reader, a nod to the poet's craft in her first book of poetry, poems on various subjects, religious and moral, published just a little over a decade before. It's a reminder that because of this book's success, Wheatley's death is worthy of a public memorial. Each iteration of this sort of remembering seems to be a memorial of its own, a way to remember that Wheatley lived and garnered attention for her living. And each notice is a kind of revision with slightly different page placement or a typesetting that speaks to who she was as a famous poet. It anticipates an individual somebodies or, or a collective sense of loss and what it means to grieve her. And there's mourning, I'd say, in the redundancy and the need to publish again what's been said before, that the literary world has lost a celebrated poet. What comes from this loss is a shared need to celebrate who Wheatley is. She is the revolutionary era poet made famous by her relationships to well-known white women and white men and by the presumed impossibility of her book's international success. There's no mention in these public memorials of who Wheatley loved or who cried when she died or who knew how old she'd be at her next birthday. What's not said in what, what's not said in the announcement is that on this December day in 1784, Wheatley is about 31 or so years old. She's a married woman, formerly enslaved to the Wheatley family that includes John, Susanna, Nathaniel, and Mary. Wheatley is from West Africa, but comes of age in Boston. She's married there in Boston too and flees to Providence, Rhode Island, when British warships occupy the town's harbor. She's lived with her husband in Middleton, Massachusetts and returns to Boston in 1783. Wheatley's back a year when she makes a widower of her husband, John Peters. Admittedly, she's lived a whole life, but the announcements of her death, despite the redundancy or maybe because of it, don't say much about her or who she leaves behind to grieve or why her, pe why her name is Peters now and no longer Wheatley. No one bothers to say who brings the news of her death to the newspapers. No one explains why there's just a sentence or less than one paragraph about the passing of this famous and local poet. But this pursuit of who did what or what's not said may miss what's true. There may be no need to say more, at least in and around the Boston area, because the newspaper's publishers and readers already know who she is. And what if they know best how to remember her or her fame. They've met the woman, the poet or interlocutor by way of her pu publicity, her books or occasional verse. And what if they've known her as a writer, as a neighbor or a confidant or as an enslaved woman well enough to hear the morning and what's not said in print? What if readers have heard about her baptism at Old South Church or the marriage to John Peters at Second Congregational Church with Reverend Lathrop, Mary Wheatley's husband, presiding? Because of her frame, because of her fame, what if they've read the proposal for her second book as advertised in 1779 and 1784, or what if they can recall just how bad her asthma was? The notices invite readers to remember her, and it seems they do. Boston's Independent Chronicle and Universal Advertiser adds a couple extra lines to include a date, time, and place for Wheatley's funeral. Last Lord's Day died, Phyllis Peters, formerly Phyllis Wheatley, known to the literary world by her celebrated miscellaneous poems. Her funeral is to be this afternoon at four o'clock from the house lately improved by Mr. Todd, nearly opposite Dr. Bullfinch's at West Boston, where her friends and acquaintances are desired to attend. Her funeral is to be held on another December day at four o'clock at Mr. Todd's, nearly opposite Dr. Bullfinch's in West Boston. The newspaper's brief eulogy summons her friends and acquaintances to her funeral. And even though there's no easy to find reference list of funeral attendees or newspaper publishers to cite, there are likely a variety of unnamed persons who show up as requested for her fu funeral. It seems probable that what they do is remember her by giving remarks, sharing their condolences, or by mentioning, by mentioning her death to those printers in Hartford or Charleston and elsewhere. 
Because despite what's left unsaid in the mortuary notices, what's true is that Phyllis Phyllis Wheatley, or as Phyllis Peters, is to be remembered for her poems, her literary contributions, and because of who she is to someone, to Boston, and to a set of newly independent states. Wheatley is somewhat enough to her friends and acquaintances to print mortuary notices, to make space for her homegoing service, and to keep her stuff. What they keep are the letters she's written, the books, the drafted verses of unpublished poems, and of course, memories too. So despite what what her biographer, one of them, Margareta O'Dell might say about Wheatley's poverty or what she doesn't have, when Phyllis Wheatley dies dies on a Sunday in December in 1784, she leaves behind stuff because she can't carry it with her, right? Um, It's the kind of stuff, paper miscellanies, in print and manuscript, to be expected of a writer. There are handwritten poems in a copy book. There are her signed books, her own poems on various subjects and the books she read. She has letters too, even if the letters, I guess now, belong to whom she wrote. But that's not all of what's left. There's the stuff too that's harder for a 21st century researcher to find or to see, because it's the stuff of mourning. It seems grief makes a collector of the mourner, and it's no different for Wheatley. It's the grieving who carry, collect, and hold on to the deceased. In this case, Wheatley stuff. And what they carry with them, all kinds of stuff, is what's used to, what used to belong to the decedent, and in this case, to the poet. And it's personal. It might be material, or it might sit at the site of memory's burdens. Whatever it is, the stuff of memory and of remem- whatever it is, it's the stuff of memory and of remembering her. It's how she's remembered or how her stuff is gathered, collected, and kept by persons looking to mourn or grieve her death or celebrate her life. And there are those who, in her own time, do the work of mourning and remembering. It's why I or you can read her stuff. It's why we have this image from the Massachusetts Historical Society right here to gaze upon. Those who mourn the poet on a December day in 1784, her friends, acquaintances, lovers, or family, carry and safely store her letters, gather her books, and keep her in mind, even maybe especially so when she dies. What's left, her stuff is gathered, collected, and organized by those who miss her and also want to celebrate her living. Her stuff makes it easier to keep hold to her, and it gives value to her living. It makes her real again to the grieving, and their grief, their remembering, with Wheatley's stuff in tow, gives these material items their enduring value. And surely it helps that Wheatley is noteworthy, is a noteworthy and best-selling writer. And it's true too, and maybe easiest to miss, that her stuff has value because it proves to the grieving her life and just how gone, dead, past, or transitioned Wheatley as a friend acquaintance, lover, or family is. So what starts as a morning ritual, an announcement about a famous woman's death, seems to me is also how to, make an, how to make an archive, though not the only way to make one. So first, someone has to mourn a death. Second, that same someone has to collect the decedent stuff. Third, they have to give it order and organize it in a meaningful way. And last, they have to find a place for it, ideally permanently. So this here is the story of a woman's death, another woman's grief, and the archive or collection of stuff that's gathered in its wake. The deceased, of course, is Phyllis Wheatley. The grieving woman is a friend of Wheatley, a woman whose name is Uber Tanner. Tanner is an enslaved, at times woman too. She lives in Newport, Rhode Island. They are likely about the same age, and their names, written in Wheatley's gracious cursive, are left behind to read or to say aloud by way of Tanner's collection of letters from Wheatley. Her letters, dated from 1772 to 1779, are addressed to her by Wheatley. Of what's left extant, Tanner is Wheatley's most consistent interlocutor. And this is true because Tanner holds on to at least eight letters for nearly 60 years. Now, the 60 years part, I got to say, is what like blows my mind. So if we had to think for a moment as ourselves, so imagine this with me. How many people have kept something for 60 years in this room by show of hands? All right, let me ask another question, slightly different. How many people have kept something that belongs to them 
for 60 years. So it's not something that was handed down by somebody, not, some, not something that, you know, you bought at, you know, an antique shop that you know is 100 years old, but something from your own self, like a letter that you wrote to a friend, um, you know, how many of us have kept something that we generated that we made for 60 years by show of hands? Okay, we got a couple. There's a hesitant one. I like that one. Like, ah, I got to do the math. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I, I pause to do that just, just in order, you know, kind of to get us to think about, like, what time looks like and what time is, in fact, doing in this, in this story. And, of course, I've got to say it, because it, it also helps to kind of blow my mind, is that, like, she doesn't have plastic. You know, she has no plastic tub to put these letters in. And though they might be made out of a paper that's more durable than our present day paper, it's still paper. Put that joker in water and it'll, it'll figure out how to be something else real quick. So, you know, I think it's, it's, the 60 years is important and you might hear me return to it kind of repeatedly and maybe redundantly only because it's a long time over the course of a life. And I think it's worth kind of, keeping in the back of your, of, of your mind. So because she keeps these letters, that's Tanner, they prove just who Wheatley is to her, and she's a friend to her. So because Tanner can't forget her, Tanner's morning has her collect, keep, and carry her friend's stuff. Tanner keeps the stuff with her friend's name on it, and her stuff has value because of Tanner's assessment of it. She collects those items that demonstrate their friendship and Wheatley's celebrity, and her collection of stuff not only proves who she is to Wheatley, but also who Wheatley is to her. And the resulting archive, to borrow a definition from archivist Dorothy Berry, are the materials, permanent records created or collected by an individual or organization because of the enduring value contained in the information they contain. So Tanner has created or collected these materials from her friend because of their lasting value to her. It's a value based on who she is to Wheatley and what she knows of the deceased, of her deceased friend and her friend's fame. And hers is not a public memorial in the way of the mortuary notices. It fits who they are to each other. And I'll say it again, they're friends. What Tanner keeps is the stuff that can remember to her just who she lost on a December day in 1784 and where she might find her. I know of Tanner's collecting habits because her collection's origin story is gathered in a footnote found in the proceedings of the Free African Union, Union oh, no, wrong society, sorry. That's another one. Found in the proceedings of the Massachusetts Historical Society. The footnote is an excerpt of a letter, not from Tanner or Wheatley, but from Catherine Eads Beecher to her nephew-in-law, Reverend Edward Hale, pastor of South Congregational Church in Boston. Does Beecher sound familiar to you all? Have you heard that name before? Where have you heard that name before? Beecher? Say it. Harriet, Harriet Beecher Stowe, right. So this is, this is worth pausing over for a moment. So Harriet Beecher Stowe has a sister named Catherine. That's not who this is. That Catherine is Catherine with a C. This is Catherine with a K. This is Harriet Beecher Stowe's brother, William. It's his wife. And she's Catherine with a K. So just so you know, the, you, the, the, to, to, to know that um, the Beecher sounds familiar, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Catherine Eads Beecher is a part of that Beecher family and she is an in-law. And um, Reverend Edward Hale married William Beecher's niece, Emily Baldwin, Emily Baldwin Perkins. So. It's a, it's, it's a whole Beecher thing happening here. So in, um, in her October 23rd, 1863 letter to Hale, the nephew-in-law, um, Beecher explains the, the little she can remember about Tanner and her collection of Wheatley-related stuff. She doesn't know Wheatley, that's Beecher. The poet dies, I think, before she was born. But she can and does speak on her relationship to Tanner. She meets Tanner as a 20-something white woman when her husband serves as pastor of First Congregational Church in Newport, Rhode Island. It's Tanner's church. Before Tanner's death, she gives her letters to Beecher, her pastor's wife. 
And she shares with the young woman seven years worth of co- correspondence from 1772 to 1779 from Wheatley to her. And I should make clear there's no extant correspondence from Tanner to Wheatley. She gives a bit of it over to Beecher just before she dies in 1833 or 1834. And it's Beecher's letter to Hale that narrates as best she can what Tanner and Wheatley mean to each other and what Tanner means to her. So every year that Tanner, after Wheatley's death, keeps the letters, the stuff, kind of recollects her grief, their friendship, and what it means to remember her deceased friend. Every extant letter is evidence of how much both women cared for each other. So because we have the letter in front of us, or at least one of them, think for a moment about the care that's, that's kind of made evident in Wheatley's penmanship. Wheatley secures a quill, ink, and enough paper to write to Tanner, even as British ships have blocked the steady flow of all manner of goods and services. It's with care, with just enough pressure, that the ink hasn't even yet bled through the paper, that Wheatley signs her name or writes words. And Tanner most times writes back to Wheatley, and Wheatley makes note of it. There's care attending to in the delivery of her letters and those of Tanner and the guarantee of their arrival. You should know that they're not using like the U.S. Postal Service because it doesn't exist. They're also not using Royal Mail. Um, there's care in managing the risk that both women take to write. What if a letter gets lost to an enemy? We have to remember it's wartime. Um, and or worse, what if an unwelcome set of wandering eyes reads their correspondence? Tanner and Wheatley, by way of their letters, their prayers, their time spent together on the page, show how they attend to what's close at hand, namely each other. Consider, too, what is required for Tanner to tend to her friend, her letters, and to remember her in this way for more than half a century. Keep in mind, Tanner holds on to this stuff while living as a refugee. Newport gets bombed a ton and occupied by the British, so she has to move to Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, she, she keeps hold to this stuff while, while working to help fundraise missionary efforts in Sierra Leone in 1793 as the president of the Free African Union Society's Women's Auxiliary, and of course, as a dying woman in 1830s in Newport. Hers is an archive made by grief and care required to hold on to love after a death. Tanner lives for more than, a ha- more than half a century without her friend, and a sense of longing is required to do the work of remembering, collecting, and holding on to a friend in what belonged to her for nearly 60 years. Consider the task of keeping paper, even if well-made for decades, and the letters are well-kept. Wheatley's cursive is legible and easy to read. The ink isn't smudged. The creases of the original folds linger, and each crease has etched a line in the paper. It would suggest that Tanner has kept the letters folded in a way, in the same way Wheatley folded them. And remnants of Wheatley's wax seal persist on some. Tanner has cared for these letters and kept these letters safe and close enough to find, reread, or to share with her pastor's wife. She hasn't lost them, or at least not all of them, in spite of the messiness of everyday living, more wars, or moving between towns. She saved them while living in Worcester, Massachusetts, as a refugee for a time, and as a bereaved friend, a wife, and later a widow. So Tanner seems to know what she's keeping and maybe why too, and at the end of her own life, she knows the letters are worth sharing because of their value, and their materiality. But what she lacks as just one person who can remember another person, place, or event is permanency. By the 1830s, Tanner is an elderly and sick woman who must be aware of her own mortality and legacy. Tanner finds a permanent place for her letters and books for her stuff when she shares what has enduring value to her with Catherine Eads Beecher. And she gives at least some of her, at least some of her stuff to Beecher because Beecher is her pastor's wife, and I would suggest a trustworthy records keeper. Tanner trusts her to understand how important the collection of stuff is. So when Tanner gives her archive, her special collection of letters and books, to Beecher, she ensures her remembering can can continue, and not just for Wheatley, but herself. What Tanner can no longer hold or touch in real life, a woman, a sister, a friend, is contained by the materiality of letters that were once that once were held and touched by her. So this is personal, it's effective, and it's her remembering at work. There's a footnote, letters, and a record of of this friendship, and a glimpse into who they are because Tanner collects and keeps these items that seemingly matter to her, and help her carry Wheatley, her friend, 
with her even after and long after the poet dies. And Beecher keeps these letters for another 30 years before she gets them to the Massachusetts Historical Society by way of that nephew-in-law. I can read Wheatley's things, we can read Wheatley's things, Tanner's collection of letters because of Tanner's loss. And to read the correspondence between these two women is to glimpse one friend's mourning. And so this is a story of provenance. It's the story of how grief makes an archive. It's the story of Uber Tanner's collection of her friend's stuff. And it begins with a poet's death on a December day in 1784. So when Tanner dies in 1835, her death is noted in the First Congregational Church's record book. There is no known copy of an obituary or newspaper announcement to mark the occasion, though if anyone knows of one, please let me know so I can correct that and also go look at it. There's not presently a list of funeral attendees or a note to say who loved Tanner most, but Catherine Eads Beecher remembers her. Beecher can't remember all the details of her conversations with Tanner when she writes that letter to, to um, Edward Hale, but she does remember Tanner. What Beecher seems to know for sure is that she and Tanner talk to each other in the years before Tanner dies in 1835. At the time between 1830 and 1833, Beecher is newly married and her husband, William Beecher, is serving as a pastor. Beecher sketches together bits of Tanner's life from what she can remember 30 years since and um, what she can remember from what she can remember about Tanner, kind of reads like a eulogy for her. And there is no, obviously, eulogy for Tanner. So what Beecher seems to do strives towards, she talks about Tanner familiarity, or at the very least, the kind of intimacy that comes with seeing an acquaintance regularly. She doesn't say how often she speaks to Tanner in those days to hear about a bygone time. Perhaps it's just on Sundays or at a Bible study or occasional visits with the sick and shut in. But because she knows Tanner and can account for her, she is familiar in her own remembering enough to mourn Tanner's death. She can call to mind the date of the elder woman's death and how the community experienced this loss. She writes to Hale, she died in the odor of sanctity. And not only is her death noteworthy for, Beech for Beecher, Tanner is photographed in her mind's eye. And it seems for Beecher, Tanner, of course, is worth remembering. I don't know what prompts Beecher to speak to Tanner, and neither woman makes note of what compels their relationship. It seems they know each other well enough for Tanner to leave her stuff behind and that of her friend with Beecher. What Tanner leaves behind for Beecher is a bit of, a, is a bit of her old letter collection, several letters from her friend. And because it's hers, each letter marks what and who matters to her. And what matters in part is her friendship to Wheatley. It's those letters that speak to who Tanner is, and she is a friend, and she's also worth remembering. And Wheatley remembers her every time she sends a letter by way of Mr. Zingo or Reverend Hopkins' son, every time she explains her silence for not writing or with every mention of Tanner's name or a dear sister. And Catherine Beecher, when Wheatley no longer can, remembers Tanner too. So Tanner's letters are available to view digitally, as we are doing, or in person at the Massachusetts Historical Society. It seems worth noting that the Massachusetts Historical Society likely has the largest extant and easy to find collection of 18th century correspondence between two enslaved, at times, black women with a well-documented provenance. This correspondence is not available by happenstance or archival luck. It's available because Tanner decides to give them to her pastor's wife, Catherine Eads Beecher. And Beecher doesn't forget them in a church basement or closet or in whatever room the church kept its records. Beecher holds on to them for another 30 years before she ensures their permanency at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And because 30 years beforehand, she, bef she befriended an elderly woman named Uber Tanner who mourned a friend and kept her letters and books in order to remember her. Thank you. So if you all have questions, it looks like Dr. Sension has a microphone. Don't all jump at once. Ooh. 
The first thing I think of is uh, how wonderful that these uh, artifacts have been saved. I wonder if in your scholarship you gradually gain a sense as to what you found, what is findable, and then what is lost forever. Uh, and, uh, and how do you go about that as a scholar in, uh, in s sifting through those, uh, those questions? You know, one of the things that I have increasingly become interested in is the question of what is my business? Now, what's tricky about that is that I delight in the 18th century. I want to know everything about all these. I want to know everything about these folks. You know, I want to be all up in their business. And yet, I also realize the extent to which there will be things that are unknowable, not just because of, let's say, a failure of the archive, but because there are things that they know that they are holding on to simply because they know them. So one of the things that I, I started to make note of in the letters between Uber Tanner and Phyllis Wheatley are those places where I imagine that there's not something explicitly said because they already know they already know the answer. So oftentimes people will ask me, how did they meet? I don't know how they met. Um, they did not put it in a letter. But if you think about your own friends, when was the last time you were like, oh, let's recount how we met? Like, that's not a thing. You don't do that. Why? Because, like, you don't need to. Um, and there are other moments in Wheatley's correspondence with Tanner where it, it becomes clear to me that there's something that's mentioned that is likely noteworthy because they both know about it, even though when I read it, like, I of course wanna know more. And can I know more? You know, I mean, at this point, like, I love going to explore like the context around, you know, um, around the letter. So if, if I have a date, you know, I might try to figure out what's happening around that date. You know, I might, you know, kind of pursue someone else's papers to see if they reference something that feels you know, like it could be relevant to what it is that I don't know. But I think that in dealing with something like a friendship, I realized like how much friendship is predicated upon like not having to say all the things, you know, in part because you and your friend know each other well enough that you don't have to go through, like you don't even have to go through your family tree at this point. Like you, you don't have to go through the family tree. You don't have to recount what your day-to-day -day habits are. The friend already knows that. And I almost think that in those in those times when I want to know more, like do I? I guess I've I've come to realize like I don't know more because I'm not their friend, <laughs> and they know enough because they are friends. So. I think I've been kind of wrestling with um, kind of what to do with that as the person who wants more of the story, who needs more of the story. Like I have to come here and tell you all things. Uh, but there are things that I might not be able to recount because I am actually outside of the intimacy of their friendship. And I'm supposed to be. I was born too late, you know, I don't know them. Um, they are deceased, you know, like there are things that I can't know. And I guess I'm, I've become all the more intrigued by the, I, I guess by sitting with the not knowing, even if it's unsatisfying a little bit, you know? I might take, I might take the microphone uh, guy's prerogative to ask a follow-up question to that, which is, um, I've read in so much of your work um, about the, the frequent, demand for the enslaved when they write, either in poetry or letters, to address slavery directly. And this is something that we have um, uh, come up with when presenting the Wheatley exhibit to, um, to, to, to different folks. So, well, what did, what did she have to say about slavery? What, does her, what do her poems say about, uh, uh, about slavery? And you, know, you noted in, in, in the beginning um, the ways in which your work tries to seek out a sort of like multi-dimensionality of their everyday. Um, 
And so in, I take it, having read you know, <laughs> their letters and a little bit of your scholarship, that the letters don't begin with, you know, dear sister, today we again failed to overthrow enslavement in New England. Um, but what, what are the sort of everyday um, joys and sorrows that they're discussing in their letters that bring that sort of multi-dimensionality of their 18th century lives out? Um, I think that there is, there are a number of topics of discussion that they kind of grapple with. You know, one big one that often doesn't get talked about is that like they're living during a war um, and they, are living where the war is happening. So, you know, Wheatley lives down the street from the Boston Massacre. The books are on the same ship as the tea that ends up in Boston's Harbor, right? Great face, thank you for that. Um, yes, like, oh my goodness, right? Um, like Newport ends up occupied by the British. Boston ends up occupied by the British. So there, there are also, there are moments where they're talking about the war. Um, I think there are other moments where they are very much kind of like, it almost feels a bit like Bible study. Like they are recounting um, their own sort of relationship to, to a Christian God and what, what that God means, means to them. And then there are these other moments that are like, ah, these are two young women talking. So my favorite, and I always talk about this because I'm obsessed. Um, my favorite moment is in a February 14th, 1776 letter. So if we orient our, ourselves in time real quick, February 14th, 1776, that's months before when? The 4th of July, there it is. Um, so things are, it, it's pretty much a, you know, a mess. Things are things are absolutely chaotic. And Wheatley makes note of the chaos. But at the end of the letter, she says to, Tan to Tanner that she um, passes an evening with Mr. Kwamina and they see Mr. Zingo. Um, that's a paraphrase. And I, I had read this letter kind of a number of times, but then I got to that sentence and I was like, what's happening in this sentence? What does it mean to pass an evening with Mr. Kwamina? Why didn't she mention Mr. Kwamina's wife? Where's Mr. Kwamina's wife at? Exactly, like her name's Duchess. Is Duchess there too? Are you just not gonna talk to Uber about Duchess? Like where's, where's Zingo Stevens' wife? Um, he has three of them at some point, like not all together, but you know. Um, you know, so I, 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 I mentioned this to an audience once and they were like, well, maybe she was at Bible study with them. It's like, okay, it's the 18th century. They're always at Bible study, right? <laughs> um, but it, 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 no matter what they were doing, because I have no idea. So I, I you know, I, I can only, you know, offer the information in a tone of suspicion, but I have no idea what they were doing. But I think that to see that sentence also kind of let me know that, like once again, I was outside of the friendship. It was worth noting that she saw Mr. Kwamina and Mr. Zingo, which is why she mentions it to her friend. She doesn't say what she was doing, but I think in the way of friends, like Uber Tanner probably knows what they were doing. That, you know, like, she, she knows what happened February 13th, 1776, but guess who doesn't know? Me. So I think that the, um, sadly, um, so I think what's cool about the letters is that a, there's so much more information that you can get about Wheatley because I think her enslavement is already what we know. Um, and I think that because it's oftentimes what we talk about, a, there's a lot of information about what her potential experience of enslavement could have been, both her own or using the example of um, the experiences of other enslaved people in New England um, to kind of help us understand her own. But what we don't have much of is like, who, who is Wheatley? Who is this woman that dies at 31? And what does it mean for her to be, you know, 20 something talking to her friend about Mr. Kwamina and Mr. Zingo? Um, at some, you know, unspecified evening activity. Um, and I think it's, it, I guess, I don't know. I, I think that there's something 
curious and interesting and compelling about that. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think I've seen presented before this idea of history as the intimacies of relationships. And I'm super fascinated in it now, and I'm excited to read your other work. I wonder if doing this historical work, looking at people's personal archives like this, has impacted how you or how you encourage others in your community and your loved ones to document your own lives and your mm. own kind of experiences, kind of thinking towards a future archive that you might be a part of. So I think that it actually is the reverse. So instead of this work informing life, life informed the work. So um, I recently had two, two deaths in my own family that were pretty heavy. And I then acquired all of this stuff. And I was like, you know, when we think about death, what we think about is the person who died, of course. Um, we talk less about like, what do I do with all this stuff? Um, and it, it, I guess, had me think about Wheatley and Tanner because Wheatley, kind of as I, I suggest, like she's so often framed as like she died with nothing. She died impoverished. She died without. And when I thought about it, I was like, well, if she died with nothing, then how do I know who she is? How do I, you know, make sense of that? And sure, there, you know, we can make note of the difference between dying with money and dying without, but a, the idea that she had nothing kind of, yeah, obscures what she did leave behind. And I think that that's what's interesting to me is thinking about the stuff that she leaves. Because Wheatley has, it's not just the letters to Tanner, it's a number of letters that are, you know, kind of scattered at various um, historical societies and special collections in various places. And she also has, you know, a copy book and, um, you know, various first editions of her own book. You know, there's, there's a, you know, relatively speaking, a fair amount of Wheatley things. And I guess it hit me that Tanner has some of those things. And I know because of this footnote um, that excerpts Kathleen Beecher's letter. So, you know, I think, yes, the two work together, like real life and research. Um, but the, my real life comes first. And that's what has me think about this footnote that I've read time and time again, but hadn't read in a way that actually thought about those 60 years. Um, and I think there's another iteration of, of thinking that I don't know if I'm going to do, but someone could do, thinking about Beecher's 30 years that she keeps the letters. So thank you so much for that incredible talk. It's such a pleasure to, to hear this talk. I, um, I have a question about your method. Um, so I was really interested in the ways that you really focus in on the materiality of these letters in order to materialize something that existed, but that our historical um, and critical apparatuses had made vanish, the friendship between these, these three women, or these two, a set, a set of female friendships, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and part of what struck me was that you were not focusing what, and what a lot of historians or literary critics like ourselves often mm -hmm. focus on, which is what's in the letters, but on the materiality of the letters. And I wondered if that's a general strategy that you have um, in order to help materialize what, you know, what, we, what we forget and what we don't see. Um, I have so many other questions, but I'll just stay there. And that was just, inc just an incredible talk. Thank you. Thanks, Monique. Um, I, I think that that's a, a new strategy for me. Um, I'm not quite the best at thinking about material culture. Um, but I think the historians have helped me think that way. Shout out to historians. Um, I, I think, like, and I also think that, um, kind of to go back to the other question, I, I think I've been thinking a lot about grief and its sort of materiality. So, so often, you know, I think grief is this thing that's like, I don't know, hard to pin down. You know, I almost think of it as like a cloud. Like it's hard to know when it's gonna pop up. It's hard to know what to do with it when it does. But there's also like 
grief has things. You know, um, I, I think about kind of the, the difficulty of throwing away my mother's clothes, for example, or donating. Like, sudden, she, she's gone, but, like, getting rid of the clothes was like, ah! I, I didn't want the clothes. I, I, I didn't know anyone else who wanted the clothes. Like, and yet, like, suddenly she was embodied in those clothes. And I think that's, like, when I actually paid attention to the... Um, the time frame associated with keeping these letters, it's like, oh, that's why you keep the letters, because your friend died. Someone asked me once, like, well, what if they weren't friends at the end or something like that? I was like, that, that doesn't matter, because Wheatley dies. So it's still about keeping, keeping her and maybe keeping the regret of, you know, not talking to her and then, or whatever it might be. I, I can't necessarily speak to that. But the keeping them is meaningful because Grief has a materiality to it. Grief is bound up in real things and not just the stuff of memory, even though it's part of that as well. So I think that, you know, I end up kind of landing at the material culture by way of, you know, kind of spending a lot of time with historians. And also, um, I, I guess, trying to theorize grief in a real sort of way as I kind of wrestle with my own stuff. <laughs> Uh, hello, uh, thank you for coming in with this informative lecture. Uh, uh, my question relates to something that you generally were not talking about, but it just keeps coming to my mind. You said that she was an enslaved uh, lady. I was wondering, she came from West Africa. Was she enslaved after? She crossed the Atlantic Ocean, or oh, okay. But her, how about her, how about her education? She, as we can see, she has the the writing skills, you know. So, was she educated after she became a slave, or how did that happen? In your scholarship, did you see anything, you know, that would be able to answer? Some of these questions, I just wonder how she got educated in order to write, to be a, become a poet, to be a poet. So I think as the story goes, the Wheatley family educates um, Phyllis Wheatley. I don't know how Uber Tanner learns, even though there are a number of uh, places where Uber Tanner could have learned in Newport. There's Sarah Osborne, for example. Um, I think Newport also is kind of committed to the literacy of enslaved people. Um, for a number of reasons. Um, so I don't know all of the particulars, but I know that it, uh, I know that she does learn. One thing that I will say about the, the question of kind of literacy and how, um, how it is the case that uh, enslaved black people learn to read is like, I think so often the presumption is to think about what black people could not do. Um, and I am, I guess I'm wondering more and more about kind of the origin of that thinking in terms of like how we remember kind of past black historical figures. Um, and I, I think I'm increasingly curious about kind of our um, kind of commitment to thinking about what black people can or could not do historically. Um, because I think that, especially around literacy matters, reading and writing, you know, I think oftentimes, and, and Bridget and I were just talking about this, oftentimes a, what we learn are about the anti-literacy laws that emerge at a very particular moment in time. Um, and if we take for a moment, you know, the, if, if we take for a moment the fact that, you know, literacy is not something that is um, kind of widespread or maybe advocated for when it comes to enslaved people as evidenced by like, Frederick Douglass's narrative, among other sorts of stories of enslaved people. One thing that strikes me as curious is like, why would we assume that 19th and 18th century black people were the most compliant human beings on earth? Because if we think about it, like, people break laws all the time, right? Like, I'm not asking y'all to out yourselves, but like, let's be clear. 
I mean, was everybody driving within the speed limit when they made their way to campus today? Probably not. Um, and there are a host of other sorts of, you know, illegalities that people engage in. Um, I mean, we haven't figured out how to stop murder, for example. I'm not saying that anyone here is a murderer, but just as 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 a thing to note, like just because something is against the law doesn't mean that people don't engage in it. And the curious thing about um, literacy is that it's the one thing that was made illegal that you can't tie to something, you know? So like, if if you live somewhere where marijuana is illegal, you have to have the marijuana. Like, if you are speeding, you need to be in the car driving fast in order for the police to stop you. But if it was, it being, if reading was made illegal today, and before we could leave this room, we had to read a piece of paper, what would we do? We would say, I, I, no, I have never learned. <laughs> and if someone was like, no, you have to read this, what would you do? Like, I can't read it. So there's also no way to check. You know, so I think that when we, when we think about the question of literacy in black people, I guess, you know, I, I, I guess what I'm advocating for is that I think we should be less surprised by it and kind of begin to assume that black people found ways to educate themselves, to educate each other. And, you know, I understand that like different regions have different opportunities for education. There's something I think very specific about Newport, Rhode Island, for example, and its literacy rates and like Boston and, and Wheatley. But I do think that, that it, you know, I guess I would just encourage us to, to, to question that presumption. Because in some weird way, it feels to me like, like racism has won. Like the idea that like, oh, of course, it was against the law, so black people didn't do it. And so they didn't learn to read until the 20th century. Um, it's like, ah, uh, I don't think that that's how that worked. Um, yeah. Please join me in thanking Dr. Tara Bynum for her talk today. Thank you all. This was fantastic. I appreciate it. <laughs>